is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you, Tally Olson. I am back. You are comfortably zoned with me, the Zigzag Man in Alameda, California. It's a beautiful summer day. We are right across the bay from San Francisco. And I'm trying to make the best of some tough times by uh, having a guest who I am so comfortable with. We enjoy each other's company. Um, We have yet to talk about life in the times that he's been on, but we certainly talk about baseball and our baseball memories. And... um, I called Steve Goldleaf. How are you doing, Steve? I oh, called him a while good. back, and I, and, yeah, and I said, uh, "Come on, I'd love to love to give it a little baseball with you." And uh, his suggestion was that um, we talk about Cleon Jones, and I didn't answer him other than to say gladly. But uh, Cleon Jones played a big part in my favorite Mets team, 1973. And uh, so if we can include 1973 in our conversation, it's um, the anniversary year, the only baseball game I ever attended, the only World Series game I ever attended attended in person as um and I grew up in in the fifties and early sixties in New York and never got to a World Series game. But I went to the sixth sixth game of the seventy three World Series and I was <laughs> Oh, it was very tough. I, I almost knew the. Yeah. Um, wow. And they could have held them back. And uh, there was all so many interesting things about that season. But let's t- talk about the man you wanted to discuss. Um, kind of an an enigmatic figure, uh, misunderstood in a lot of ways, misunderstood in um, the one World Series game that Gil Hodges came and took him out of. And Gil's reason for taking him out was uh, misunderstood. And uh, in short, Cleon... Uh, was the first hope of an original Met fan for for coming out of it. He came up a little early, but um, take it away, if you would, Stephen Goldbeef. Yeah, well, um, thanks, Ralph. Uh, what I actually wanted to talk about was a kind of oddity that um, relates to Jones's overall career, um, which is that I was doing a little noodling around, studying some statistics, and um, this is a a little bit of a a digression, but what I was studying was the the odd phenomenon that left-handed batters have a much larger gap between how they hit right-handed and left-handed pitching than right-handed batters do. And I was looking up the numbers of a lot of of right-handed and left-handed batters to verify this, and what I came up with is that that they have, on average, a difference that's almost twice as large as right-handed batters. And I think the reason for that is that... um, right-handed pitchers are that much more common. So they just get that much more experience batting against right-handed pitching, and therefore even the the left-handed batters um, just have a a hard time because they're only getting to face 
uh, a pitcher from the opposite side as they are, um, just you know, once every three or four days, and that's just not enough to get um, comfortable. So um, anyway, but while I was doing the study, I, w- I just ran Cleon Jones, and I looked at his numbers, and they reminded me of somebody's. And what I did was I looked up that somebody, and I said, wow, this is almost identical. That somebody is Lou Brock. Um, wow. And, uh, you know, you might not think it to, to you know, look at, at, you know, Brock's career, which is a Hall of Fame career and, you know, a 3,000 hit guy and, you know, a very famous um, ball player. And, and Jones is sort of, you know, I think, you know, you, you would – agree with me that, you know, Jones's career was overall a little bit disappointing. He had a couple of really high years where he did really excellent. But um, besides those, you know, maybe three or four re- really good seasons, um, he was a, a kind of a flash in the pan. He was all washed up by the age of, of 32, I think it was. Um, so you don't really think of that as, as a comparison. But what I noticed was that he had almost the exact same on-base percentage and the almost exact same slugging percentage. And, of course, that adds up to a total of uh, the same exact um, OPS, um, which wow. is those two statistics put together. And uh, I'm, I'm well, looking at this. And I'm, Rock's stolen base total is ah. paramount. It, that makes all the difference in how we judge Rock's career. It's true. Uh, I, I have two arguments to make against that. One of them is that, I mean, Brock obviously has a better career because he had a much longer career. Um, there's no question of the fact that he came up before Jones a couple of years earlier, and he right. lasted a long time after Jones had retired. So, I mean, th- th- that's all to Brock's credit. But as far as the stolen bases go, what we often don't really account for is the unseen negative. Because uh, when you talk about somebody's, on, somebody's stolen base uh, totals, you're talking of, of just a number of stolen bases he has, um, but we don't really think about how many times did this guy get thrown out and cost his team a base runner and cost his team an out? Um, and they've, they've sort of quantified this a little bit and come up with a rough formula that um, if you're stealing two bases and you get thrown out once, um, that pretty much comes out to a wash. Um, that you you do as much for your team um, by just staying on first base and not trying as you do if you steal two out of three bases. So what we're really looking at is is Brock's net total of um, stolen bases above two thirds, and that you know it's not nothing. It it comes out to um, roughly um, 16 stolen bases a year without being thrown out. Um, but you think about that, and that's really not all that much. I mean, that's like, you know, three bases that Brock gains um, that Jones didn't gain, uh, and that, you know, doesn't amount to maybe maybe his team would, would win an extra game or two over the course of the season because of, of, of you know, Brock's stolen bases. So, anyway, that but was there, the audit. There's that one, there's that one intangible that isn't reflected in any stat. And that's how a guy like Brock or Henderson or even Willie Mays um, upset, Jackie Robinson certainly upset a pitcher and threw the pitcher and the catcher and the defense off its, its, um, its mark. And, yeah, that's- um I mean, that's yes. a, a, a psychological thing where the pitcher just had to be concentrating on Brock every time he got on base. And that was absolutely the, the, the case. But, um, 
you know, some saying. I, I just don't think that much of, of stolen bases as, as, you know, an attribute. But the other thing in the comparison, of course, is that they also have a certain similarity on defense because they both came up as very fast guys who – were put into center field by the teams who really needed a center fielder, which is the very early 60s Cubs and the very early 60s Mets. And they, both teams said to themselves, okay, we finally got you know a guy who can really burn. Uh, let's put him in center field and see what he does. And what they found out was he really wasn't, both of them really weren't very good um, defensively, so they ended up sticking them it, for almost their entire careers in, in left field. And, you know, that is another quality that they had in common. And I don't know if you remember Jones defensively. Um, do, do you have any, any memories of him in the field? I, I don't. I don't in particular. Um, hmm. No. But well, I um, mean, that, that may say it all. <laughs> uh I don't have any memories of any outstanding catches like the Swobodas and the, and the Tommy Ages and um, uh, but I don't really have any negative memories either. So um, that may be good. Well, you know, it's a funny thing because again, I thought of Jones as being, you know, a an average left fielder. I thought he was, you know, pretty adequate in the field. But I came across a very strange clip. Uh, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this um, company called Flagstaff. Um, do they put out videos of old baseball games? Have you ever run across oh, them? No, no. I love. Uh, I get my videos of old baseball games and the audio off of YouTube, who, well, um, they carry. a lot of this stuff on YouTube. You might not have noticed the name of a lot of, oh, of these. Clips, that's very possible. This is the company that, that does a lot of those things. So here's the interesting part about this. I wrote a little bit about this on the Bill James site, and I'll try to sum it up quickly. Um, but I was watching a, a little bit of a, a game, just a kind of random game, in I would say it was looks like it was 1966 or 67, and this is still when the Mets were pretty bad. Um, this is roughly a year or two before Gil Hodges uh, signed up to manage them, and they were a last place team. And I'm watching the, the, play, the Jerry Bo the Jerry Butchek years. Yeah, as a matter of um, fact, Jerry Buchek was playing in this game, um, um, as it happens. Okay. And, um, what, and, and the game, just by coincidence, was against the Cardinals, so I don't think Brock figured into it. And what I saw was that it was just a kind of a random inning, and what I saw was that the Cardinals were batting, and they got, um, a, I would say maybe, you know, inning, they got maybe three or four hits, singles and doubles. And what stuck out to me was that Cleon did two things, or he did one thing twice, um, that was absolutely Ruinous cost the Mets a couple of runs and ended up costing them the game, but the announcers didn't point it out, and it didn't get recorded as a fielding error either time. But what he did both times was he threw to the wrong base. Um, the, there was a, a man on second, somebody singled to left field, and Cleon threw the ball over the shortstop's head into home, we had no chance to catch the runner. The runner was, was safe by a mile. And, of course, the guy who hit the single took second base. And the same thing happened again a couple of, uh, of batters later. And I'm saying, ah, now it all comes together. Now I understand why the Mets lost so much. Um, and obviously it's not all Cleon's fault, but they just didn't have what you might call the sale. 
um, the the know how right um, to play the game the right brains. and would do that sort of thing that wouldn't go down as an error that wouldn't um, you know none of the announcers noticed it but to me it, it, it jumped out as oh this is why they they were you know so horrible in in those early years they had a lot of young ball players or players who didn't really know how to play the game very well. And it was the mental aspect, you know, sort of like what you were talking about with the psychology of Lou Brock on on first base um, that really ended up costing them a lot. And, I, you know, I, I wrote in the Bill James column, you know, maybe this is the only runners that Jones threw to the wrong base on all season long, and I'm just giving him a hard time because he stuck out to me. But I, I suspect that probably that's not the case, that – that you know, small things like throwing to the right base and keeping runners from advancing unnecessarily um, really was the the um, the key to to playing smart, sharp baseball. The '62 Mets epitomized that, and um, even the, the the veterans. Uh, Thornberry wasn't a rookie, for instance. But they made stupid mistakes. Richie Ashburn didn't always make great decisions. Um, Felix Mantia, Keneal, that was a horrible experience watching them. It was cute for a couple of months, and we were glad to have the Mets back, National League Baseball back in New York. But, wow. Until '69, and um, they were tough years, but yeah. they were built. Well, they they were built very quickly. Um, uh, Whitey Herzog came in and helped uh, give credit to George Weiss uh, for uh, doing certain things that made them a champion. Seven years after being as bad as they were, they became world champions. Can't say enough about that. Um, no, it was one of the great miracles of, of my youth. Um, you know, yes. being a, a Met fan and seeing all of a sudden this team that had gotten derided um, by all of my classmates and all of a sudden yes. they, were, they were the champions. Yeah, if you grow, if people listening, if you grow up in New York, for instance, you're either back then a Dodger fan, a Yankee fan, or a Giant fan. And then later when the Mets came in, the Yankees were still great. And the memories of having all those games played, all those World Series when it was a birthright in New York almost to have that and then have them so be so horrible that um, it wasn't fun for a teenager um, in those years. And But by the time they came around, I was living my life in California, and um, it was difficult to follow them. But fun, um, hmm. great time, great times. Um, yeah, and, and in the year you were talking about before '73, that was also the only postseason game that I ever attended, and I was actually in the right field stands the day that Pete Rose ran over Bud Harrelson and. Oh. Um, got into a tremendous melee on the field, and it was, you know, one of the most exciting, um, you know, moments I, I'd ever seen. It was, uh, uh, you know, a great victory because the Mets were ahead um, that day, I think something like nine runs. I think the, actually I think the, the score was, the final score was, was nine to two, so seven runs. But, um when Rose ran into to Harrelson, um, the umpires threatened to forfeit the game to the Cincinnati 
Reds because the fans were being unruly and weren't letting the, the Reds um, go back out on the field. So um, Willie Mays and Yogi Berra and Tom Seaver and Rusty Staub, who had hit two home runs, went out to left field where the fans were throwing stuff at Pete Rose, who was playing left field. And um, they virtually begged the fans to behave because, you know, we've got a, a big lead here and we want to win this game. Right. They were going to forfeit the, the entire game or just... Uh, no, the, yeah, they were going to forfeit the, the game to the Reds. Oh, um, wow. I don't remember that specifically. I yeah, do well, remember... The thing I remember most is, is the gesture of particularly, and you, you'll enjoy this, Ralph, because this is your favorite ball player, but Willie Mays just went out and he, he virtually begged the fans to calm down. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Met fans had a lot of affection for Willie, um, and that was, you know, his last postseason. So um, right. they obeyed, and um, the game went on. But that was, that was a very wow. exciting game. It was an exciting World Series, and I befriended Nancy Finley in uh, my podcasting. And she's done a lot of podcasting for me. And she sent me some memorabilia in that 1973 game that I'm referring to in the sixth game. Jack Benny threw out, and I might have told you this before, he threw out the first pitch for Charlie Finley. And um, Nancy sent me a picture of um, Jack Benny and her uncle, Charlie Finley. So in looking back, looking back, I have some mixed emotions with the A's um, living in Northern California all these many years. And um, the A's were going through an incredible dynasty, the last great dynasty and um, I would have preferred that the, the Mets won the sixth, sixth game. And, that's, and I'm saying that um, I'm understating that to the point where it still makes me sad after all these years. Yeah, but, well, um, um, you, know, you have nobody but Yogi um, Berra to blame because he decided to start Seaver on short rest, and the next day he had to start... John Matlack on short rest, and they both um, ended up losing those games. Very true. Very true. And Matlack was such an underrated, just off the top of my head about that guy. He was so steady and underrated and um, added to that uh, Kuzmin and, um, and Seaver rotation beautifully. And throw in the relief pitching of McGraw, and uh, you really had something. Um, It was um, a great year, 73. And um, anyway, anything you'd like to finish with about uh, Mr. Cleon Jones? Well, the other thing I wanted to add was uh, this might be an assignment for you, but um, Cleon is going to turn 80 in, I think, just about two weeks, uh, beginning of August. He's going to um, have his 80th birthday. And uh, I don't know if, if you can arrange to get him on the air, but that would be, you know, a real coup, I think, to have a, a, a talk with, with Cleon Jones. I will try, and I know who to go through is um, uh, Mr. Horowitz, who I just sent a copy of my book to, and he wrote that great book. So um, we have a connect yeah, there. And Horowitz put, to get, put together the old-timers thing, but I, I, he's one of those um, people I haven't met. I've met recently on Facebook Archamsky, and I'm trying to get an interview with him. 
Um, yeah, he's he's terrific. I, I reviewed um, his book called After the Miracle on on the James site when I was writing for them, and it was the, easily the most positive review I've ever written. Um, I, I just recommended it as I as I wrote as a work of art. Um, it was wow. it was just uh, I don't know if you, if, you, if you had a chance to read this, but it's I, a, a I didn't. Touching. Did he go back and talk to Siebel and uh, Harrelson and uh, didn't they have a reunion around that book? Yeah, well, that's the thing. The structure of the book is a kind of odd structure. He he describes getting together a bunch of teammates, um, and he got Harrelson, Swoboda, Jerry Kuzman, himself, and the author of, he he wrote it with uh, uh, a guy named Eric Sherman, who's a very fine writer of of, uh, books about baseball primarily, and they agreed to uh, fly out to California Uh, and together, and then do a long drive up to the Napa Valley to visit. And it was both, you know, touching and sad. And in the course of of, of the book, what happened was that he described the drive that they took. And I don't know if you know this about Kuzmin and Swoboda, but they come from opposite ends of the political spectrum. Kuzman is apparently a fierce conservative and a big Trump guy and a, a right-wing um, character. A, sh- a schmeckler. Exactly. And, and, and Kuboda <laughs> exact opposite. So they're arguing, but they're arguing in, in this, as I described it, in the, the sort of good-natured way that brothers will argue with each other ferociously. But um, you know, with, with a lot of love for each other, but also with a lot of in, intensity and passion. And um, Harrelson, of course, was suffering from dementia, uh, as as Seaver was. So there's a sort of edge of pathos to all of, of this, as they're all sort of struggling to come together and to join. And in the course of the book, Chamsky details the 1969 season in minute detail. Uh, in other words, he goes into things that I never came across in all the years that I've been reading books about the 1969 Mets, and he described all of these incidents that I either had misunderstood or misremembered in, in really fine detail, and he, he tells you know, the, there's just a lot of anecdotes that go into that book. I, I just thought it was the, the most fabulous book that I've ever reviewed, certainly. I will, on your recommendation, I will go to Amazon and order it today. That oh. is a team that is so well storied. Guys like Durso and um, uh, I, uh, Leonard Coppett wrote great books about that team. Uh, so, on your recommendation, uh, further anecdotes. Uh, I didn't think that. I didn't think that could ever happen, and um, so I look forward to that. I look forward to getting that book. Yeah, it'll, it'll give you all the details about Don Cardwell ripping the love beads off of Ron Swoboda's neck on a plane flight. That will, will oh. just make you, your your eyebrows singe. Wow. Wow. Hey, would you do me a favor and would you come back on a more uh, steady and often basis? Uh, Anytime. I just just love chatting with you. And I love it that you're in good voice. And you told me off air that you're 70 years old. And... um, um, that's that's terrific. Good voice and good mind. You haven't missed a beat, and uh, you make uh, make it um, almost an inspiration uh, for old guys like myself. 
You know, it's always great talking with you, Ralph. No greater pleasure than spending a half hour with you on the phone. Beautiful. Steve, go leave late. Steve or Steven, which would you prefer? I, I don't object to either. Okay. I'll call you either or neither. How about that? No, I won't. I'll call you Stephen because uh, that's what I'm used to doing. Stephen Goldleaf, it's a pl- pleasure as always. Thank you for listening. Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. I'm blessed to have the most interesting people on the face of the planet to talk to. Stephen Goldleaf is no exception. Adios and happy trails. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.